You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers? I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! You may not be able to handle the truth, but these guys can. Welcome to the Long for Truth Show. Heretic hunters. Hey, what do you think of these guys? I think they're damned and on their way to hell, and I don't think there's any redemption for them. You stink, frankly. That's the way I think about it. Hello and welcome to the Long for Truth Show. My name is Dan Long, and on this episode of Long for Truth, we have a very special guest, Coffee, no, not Coffee, Kofi, I do, Bowen, and uh, I believe I'm getting his name right, Um, I know I didn't when I said Coffee, I actually called him Coffee by accident in the interview, and (laughs) and now he said he's had that happen to him before, but um, it is rather embarrassing when you're interviewing someone and you get their name wrong. His name isn't Coffee, it is Kofi Adu Bowen, and um, he is right now still in California, as a matter of fact. Um, just got finished with the Strange Fire Conference. Steve and I had a, just a fantastic time uh, with our brother, uh, just uh, interviewing him, talking to him about the conference. And, uh, you know, as as sometimes it happens, you don't stay on the same topic. We kind of went here, there, and everywhere in this interview, but we, we still had a great time. Just a fantastic time. Kofi is a great guy. Um, he, he really... Um, uh, had a good time there at the conference, had some good insights uh, into uh, what it was all about. And uh, I'm excited to play this interview for you. Now, what I do want to warn you about is there are a little bit of Skype issues going on, and you'll hear some um, some of the voices drag a little bit. But uh, I am the one that is um, conducting the uh, the main side with the, with the uh, equipment on this end while I have Steve on Skype and Kofi on Skype as well in California. Of course, Steve is in Elizabeth City, North Carolina. Him and I have not done a podcast together. I said in the in the interview, I said two months. I think it's been a lot longer than that. But but uh, we uh, we're together again in this episode, and it's been a while since I've done a podcast as well. I have uh, had uh, some very uh, big uh, work issues going on. It's been keeping me away from this microphone. But hopefully, Lord willing. We'll be back and doing, uh, uh, you know, more podcasts and uh, having some uh, more discussions. And, uh, of course, as you know, here at, uh, uh, at least at Long for Truth, we are not the only ones who have been speaking, talking about Strange Fire. Uh, we've done three or four episodes, I think two dedicated completely to just that topic. But uh, they're, they're, this Strange Fire uh, buzz has been going on for months and uh, just like everybody else, you know, we, we, we're riding the strange fire bus. So uh, just I, without any further ado, I'm just going to play the interview. Uh, may not comment at all at the end of the interview. Just may just play the outro music and, and, and go on and uh, let you know that um, if I don't get to that, it's kind of late, so I probably won't. Uh, you can f- you want to talk to us about the interview, talk to us about the show, you can find us at uh, longfortruth.com. Facebook, eh, wait a minute, what, man, it has been so long since I've done this, so, <laughs> long for truth forward slash Facebook dot com, something like that, you can find us on Facebook, Facebook, look us up there, um, but uh, without any further ado, here we go. Hello, good to be back together, Danny, it's been uh, quite a while, actually. I was going to say that, it's been probably about, what, two months uh, yeah, since you months. and I have done something together. That's right. You just did a Strange Fire uh, preview show last week. You just put yes. that up. Yep. So uh, thanks for that. We, we just wanted to introduce the topic for tonight's uh, show. We are going to be talking about what uh, bloggers and other podcasters have been talking about uh, throughout the week, and that is the Strange Fire Conference. And, Steve, we have a very special guest, as you had promised uh, on the last podcast on this show, uh, why don't you introduce him? 
Uh, yes, we have right now in California, Kofi Adu Bowen, and I hope I did not slaughter his name. So, <laughs> Kofi, welcome to the podcast. We are very, very glad that you could come and join us. Sirs, it's an absolute pleasure to be on with you. All well, we right. appreciate it. And, Kofi, I'm going to kind of hand it over to you because I'm just going to let you give a little bit of background information about yourself and who you are before we start actually talking about the Strange Fire Conference. So why don't you take it away for us? Sure. Well, Kofi Adebowen, I am 22 years old from London, England originally, but my parents come from Ghana. I'm the oldest of four children and graduate in journalism. And wow just about to start working for a creative design agency. When I'm not doing all of that, I'm a Sunday school teacher at my local church, Grace Life London, as well as a blogger over at FieryLogic.com. All right. What, now, tell, tell us a little bit about FieryLogic.com. Right. Well, FieryLogic is the second blog I've had. Um, previous to that, I had a blog called Wives for Truth and spent a good couple of years doing that. That came to an end for various reasons and um, picked up blogging again. And the reason it's called Fiery Logic is I initially wanted to call it Logic on Fire to borrow Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones' expression about preaching. Mm. But someone had already got that got to it before me. So <laughs> kind of flipped it around and said Fiery Logic, and that's how Fiery Logic was born. All right. And, and Kofi, I, I have to tell you, I have been following your blog since you were 17. And I remember when I first found your blog through another link and i remember at the time on your bio you said you were 17 years old and you had just gotten really kind of come to the truths of reformed theology and uh i've been following you for the last five years or so man and, and i love it and i am absolutely jealous of your accent i'm sorry <laughs> i've always thought <laughs> british accents were so cool i'm jealous so <laughs> i mean it's been crazy i mean obviously i've been here for a week and I get that reaction from everyone I speak to. It's like, oh, I love your accent. Like, <laughs> which is weird because back home, people find my accent very annoying. So <laughs> to find everyone who loves my accent, it's just fantastic. I wish I could live here. Did John MacArthur comment on your accent? He did. Funny enough, he did it, but Todd Friel did, which was really weird. <laughs> Literally, he, um, I was talking to him, and he just had this look on his face of just complete bewilderment. And then he said, you're black. black. I was like, Yes, I am. Said, well, you have an English accent. I was like, I do. He goes, this is so amazing. I was like, really? <laughs> <laughs> now, I've never got a chance to meet Todd Friel, but my the guy that I co-pastor with actually uh, has met Todd Friel on a, uh, a couple of other occasions. And uh, he was at my, my friend, my co-pastor, was actually a uh, team leader at the Ambassadors Academy. And I know Todd Friel has been hooked up with those folks out there, Ray Comfort and Tony Miano and Kirk Cameron out there. So, is he freakishly tall like everybody says he is? Yes. Yeah. If you see the photo on Facebook with me, he towers over me, and I'm <laughs> I'm a reasonable five ten. I mean, he just towers over it, it, me. He's like, yeah. Yeah. It looked like he was actually kind of hunching down a little bit there to get in the picture. <laughs> a little, a little. Make the man feel bad, man. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, while we're talking about people we have met i did guys i i did get to go to westboro massachusetts a couple of yes. months about a month ago got to meet one of my favorite podcasters uh pastor mike abendroff went to um went to uh his church listened to a great message that he preached and then he took me to the no compromise studios got a picture with him and all so i mean i i know it's not john MacArthur, but i can say that uh I was listening to uh, Mike Abendroff's podcast yesterday, and he did say he preached from the pulpit there at Grace Community Church. Of course, he preached from the pulpit to three other janitors because he was a janitor in the church. But, <laughs> but, <laughs> but anyway, he actually um, he he was actually getting ready to host. Uh, I think that day, as a matter of fact, was getting ready to host um, uh, Todd Friel's Wretched Radio since Todd Friel was there in California. So I did at least get to get to get to get a picture with somebody that was uh, you know, somebody of note anyway. So funny enough, um, I met the Tuesday guy while I was here. You met uh, who? 
Steve Cooley, the Tuesday guy on No Coke. Oh, um, did you really? I met Steve Cooley too the other day, or yeah, last couple of months ago. He was ago. around for the conference, so I bumped into him. Very nice guy. Yeah, very, very good. All right. Well, um, so really quickly, before we jump into Strange Fire Coffee, will you tell us um, a little bit about how you came to the Reformed faith? Sure. Well, I um, grew up in a Christian family. My father was a pastor. My mom is a teacher's assistant. And from the earliest, I knew about God, Jesus, the Bible. Would be a nominal Christian, if you were to put a label to it. Mm-hmm. But I became a Christian at 14. And having only ever been exposed to going to church with my parents in Pentecostal churches, watching Christian television, I simply just threw myself headlong into that as the only Christianity I had really known. Wow. And it wasn't until I was 17 that, in God's providence, I came across some stuff online questioning one of my favorite Word of Faith preachers, um, Creflo Dollar. Mm. And as I started to examine this stuff, I began to notice I didn't have any answers to it. And not having any answers to it, I became more and more convicted that this stuff was horrible, that this wasn't the gospel of Jesus Christ at all. Amen. But the problem then became, well, what is the truth? If this isn't it, and this is all the Christianity I've ever known, well, what is the truth? And God in his providence put me in touch with a godly um, retired preacher who really just mentored me in the faith. And he was a Presbyterian man and introduced me to the doctrines of grace, put good books in my hand, we studied scripture together. And so I was 17 years old when that happened. Eventually got plugged into the Metropolitan Tabernacle. um, Here in, well, I was just about to say here in London, but I'm in California. Wow. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Mr. Chad, I tell you. Yeah. Just a little bit. Um, <laughs> back home in London, um, was there for about four years. And that was just a time where God really poured into me through his word and, you know, just became further and further grounded in the doctrines of grace. And so that's how I came to the doctrines of grace, mostly through the influence of, of both this um, godly Presbyterian preacher and through the influence of many things I was reading online and through ministries like uh, Ligonier and Grace Amen. to You and Desiring God. Coffee, that's awesome, man. I, I or Kofi, I'm, I knew I was going to call you Coffee. I, <laughs> a lot of people have called me Coffee this week. It's okay. <laughs> uh, anyway, I uh, <laughs> no, I think that I think that's fantastic, and and like I said, it, uh, it it's it, it's you're not the only one that has that story of coming out of Pentecostal backgrounds, which this gives a, a great jump into uh, the, the Strange Fire Conference. Um, uh. Steve, you have here that the real heart of the issue is the sufficiency of Scripture, and I also think, as I'm, and, and, and unfortunately, I did not get to live stream it, Steve, like you did, and uh, well, so I, I only got to. I tried to live stream, and several of them would not do it. I so I only got to watch one of the Phil Johnson ones okay. uh, about the providence of God, and I was trying to uh, live stream Todd Friel, but somehow I missed it. I don't know. I don't know how, but I did. Well, I didn't get to, but I did get to read some of the um, some of the transcripts, and I read uh, some of John MacArthur's uh, opening um, conference uh, message, and that was just, I mean, that that was just amazing. Um, so let let's jump into this. Uh, let's jump into this topic of strange fire. So, just give us a quick little bit of overview of what you took out of the. Uh, you know what you got out of this. What 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 you saw. Some of the things you saw. Some of the things that you really that really impacted you as you uh, as you were there. Sure thing. Um, I think coming into this conference, I didn't know what to expect. Yeah. I have heard Dr. MacArthur on this subject in the past. One of my favorite books continues to be Charismatic Chaos, which he wrote back in I think it was ninety one. Yes, um, it was. It was in the early nineties. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, in the early nineties. Um. Still one of my favorite books on the subject. But generally, I had no idea what I was letting myself in for. All I knew was I was looking forward to it, and I was going to be there. But from the minute the conference started, the, one of the big notes that was sounded was the importance of the sufficiency of Scripture. Mm-hmm. Yes. I mean, yes. if there was one thing I can say that I've walked away from this conference more assured in, it's the importance of the sufficiency of Scripture. Amen. I mean... That has been hammered 
by every single speaker, regardless of... And it's interesting that there was such a widespread. You had Dr. MacArthur, who is a, more or less a Bible church type of guy. Mm-hmm. You have Steve Lawson, who's a Baptist. You have Conrad Bayway, who's a confessional Baptist. R.C. Sproul, who's a Presbyterian. And regardless of their denominational distinctives, they all came together to sound this note that, listen, Scripture is sufficient. And that's one of the major issues with the charismatic movement. It's a tacit denial of the sufficiency of Scripture. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, and that is that is the one thing that, uh, that I thought about, too. And, you know, hearing all of these people slam MacArthur for doing this and uh, guys like Michael Brown uh, and Danny, we were reading the other one. I can't even remember the guy's name over at uh, Papio. It's just, I got yeah, the Naked name. Pastor. The what, what, what was his name? The, well, I mean, he goes by the title of the Naked Pastor. Well, that was the title of the article, yeah. But I read his arguments against the strange fire, and the one thing I noticed that all of these guys have in common is they're all appealing to some type of an emotionalism or unity. They're not appealing to Scripture. There is no Scripture whatsoever that they bring up in order to say MacArthur should not be pointing out these false teachers. Uh, I just, I, I don't get it. I don't understand. If they really believe in the sufficiency of Scripture, why are they, that they not behind MacArthur for having this conference, for pointing out all these blasphemies and things that are going on? Well, that's instead, the thing. Uh, I mean, I'm just saying instead they're they're trying to do this kumbaya type of thing. And, you know, I understand unity. Unity is important. But when you got people blaspheming, doing all kinds of blasphemous stuff, being drunk in the spirit, being slain in the spirit, I'm sorry. That, that goes beyond the limit. That goes beyond it. Yeah. And, you know, um, you and I talk a lot about the sufficiency of Scripture here on, on the podcast. And I think that the main thing that bothers me, and, Co- and, and Kofi, you can, you can chime in on this too, is that with the, with the, with the idea that, uh, you know, that God is, is giving more revelation or desires to give us more of revelation seems to, to, at least in my opinion, it seems to, to, to show that, well, there are Christians who aren't really satisfied what God is, with what God has already said. They, it's almost as if they need more. There's, it, it's, it, it's a re- it's really boils down to a faith issue, am I right? I would think so. Um, and we'll probably get into this later on, but for me, two of the most impactful talks at the conference were given by Pastor Conrad and Bayway from Zambia. Mm-hmm. Um, now, I've been listening to him on and off for the last couple of years. Great, solid man. I genuinely didn't know what he was going to bring to the table um, until the first message, and that first message blew me away. Because a lot of the stuff that he discussed is stuff that I had seen growing up. Um, I would love to tell you that what he said were just aberrations and stuff that happens on the fringe, but not anymore. I think in African circles, that's now the norm, not the fringe. And seeing that and seeing some of the responses of people saying, oh, why is he... um, making these claims, and why is he talking about this? This is just being divisive. I was was following some of it on Twitter, and I couldn't help but think, but hold on. If our charismatic friends had been more self-critical as a movement from the outset, possibly we wouldn't be having this conversation because this conference probably wouldn't have happened. Absolutely. If they had checked some of the excesses in their movement, it wouldn't have got to the stage that it's gotten now. It yeah. definitely wouldn't have got to the stage on the continent where I'm from. Right. Because they take their lead from what's happening here in the quote-unquote West. Right. Now, over in London, how, how, how prevalent is this? Uh, is the charismatic movement there? Well, in London, it's very different to how it is over here in the U.S. Um, you have your more conservative charismatic types Mm -hmm. and then with emigration of Africans into the UK over the last 15-20 years, many of them have brought their churches from back home with them 
And so that was the case with the church I grew up in. It was a, the church I grew up in was a local church for a denomination that had started back in Nigeria. And wow. when people obviously moved from Nigeria to England, they brought the church with them. And so you have that. And what's happened with that is in many of those churches, um, you have the denominations and then you have loads of independent congregations with particularly with the independents because they're independent there's no one they're accountable to it's just become a free fall mm. and many of the things that pastor conrad talked about the sort of appealing to people on the basis of come get your breakthrough come get your healing come get your deliverance is incredibly widespread wow and, and then you add to that the influence of groups like i hop and bethel you know oh, boy. jesus culture you add that influence, and there's a lot of particularly young people who get caught up in that. And so now you've got churches springing up, doing similar things and saying similar things and using similar kinds of language to I, Hop, and Bethel and the New Apostolic Bunch. And so that's when the, that's becoming a problem, and I can only foresee it getting worse as the years go by and as these young people grow up and become adults and become the next generation of their churches. You know... I, I saw a video um, about a year ago on YouTube, and it was a pastor in an African church, and he was preaching a prosperity gospel. And it was, this was not like, I mean, this was a small, little, almost hut-like church. And he was, he was telling people that if they would just lay some, some, uh, some money up there on the altar, that God would bless their chickens and God would bless their goats. and their. They, I mean, he just went on and on. And I was shocked. I was absolutely shocked. I had no idea until recently how widespread the charismatic movement and the prosperity gospel and word faith has uh, moved into Africa. Yeah, it's become incredibly prevalent. Um, I think I've seen that video. Um, I think it was Christianity Today who put that video together. Okay. Um, with, uh, yes, I think I've seen that. Okay. And in the video, which is, if I remember right, it's like a um, very um, rudimentary building. Yep. And this very well-dressed man has money being thrown at his feet and all the yes, rest of it. Yes, that's um, the one. Yeah, that is very much the norm now. And wow. you have, there's an, in that same video, there's another man who appears in there, um, whose name I won't mention, um, just because I don't want to give him any more publicity. Um and in, his, in that video, he says something which is incredibly profound for all the wrong reasons. He says that people don't, people in the West see what we preach and they criticize. But if they understood the struggle that we came from with the poverty and the not having anything, and we only understood that God was our only hope, they would understand the way we preach. Hmm. And that's the common argument I hear from so many. Listen. People don't understand the problems that we as Africans face. We understand our problems. That's why we have the form of Christianity that we do. We can't do stuff as the quote-unquote white man does it. Because if we do things the way he does, he does not have the problems that we have. Totally forgetting that, actually. Um, firstly, in Christ, there is no Jew or Greek. In other words, right. while, yes, we do have our cultural distinctions, and sometimes those things can be very pronounced, Christianity is not affected by those cultural differences. Mm -hmm. It's not that you have a form of Christianity that appeals to one culture and a form of Christianity that appeals to another. Exactly. And the failure to understand that all goes back again to a failure to understand the sufficiency of Scripture. Amen, if bro. Is Preach it! You know, if <laughs> Scripture is indeed sufficient, you'll see that actually... As long as we minister from God's word, God's word will deal with the problems that are indeed important. Absolutely. Right. But because scripture is not being opened, to use Pastor Connor's expression, the book is constantly closed. That's why you can end up with a mythical fig, a semi-mythical figure called the man of God, who people go to, and he has this sort of eerie otherworldliness about him kind of like the old school catholic priest mm -hmm. you know he has a sort of yeah. otherworldliness about him and you know he can do things spiritually that you can't that happens when you close the bible and you kind of open yourself up to the influence of this rather than the influence of god's word amen yeah yeah that's uh and, and again it like you said you hit it on the head it all boils down to the sufficiency of scripture and it all boils down to what is your authority. 
And it's funny because we were talking about this this morning in our men's study. In our men's study, in our church, we're going through the book uh, Sola Scriptura, uh, the Protestant view of the Bible. And uh, it's an older book, and MacArthur and School and some others are, are some authors in it. And one of the things that I brought up was about these extra-biblical revelations and these people that are receiving these words from God. And the Bible makes it very clear that if you do it the, the quote-unquote wrong way, or if you what you say doesn't come true, or if what you say isn't from God, then you're a false prophet. And what I began to uh, discuss with this other guy is the fact that if these people are saying that my vision lines up with Scripture, and I need to go to the Word of God to justify my Scripture, then what they're really saying is what God has told me is already in Scripture. So if what God has already told me is in Scripture, why do we need their vision? And, you know, we're kind of going, bouncing this idea back and forth. What is your idea on that, Kofi? Do you, do you, do you agree with that? Do you think it's a, a different issue altogether or, or what? Hmm. Um, I'll put it the way I heard a pastor that I um, once knew, the way he put it. He was talking about this issue of prophecy in particular. And he was saying that, Yes, it's all well and good to have the written word of God, but where's the living word for today? <laughs> I think that sums up the problem to a T. To a T, yes. Because you say, script, it comes, this is the problem. We start with the presupposition that here's the scriptures. Now, the scriptures are good for what they do, but I have different problems that scripture does not address. Therefore, for all the stuff that scripture does not address that I think is important, I need something else. And loads of group do this. So the Roman Catholics will say, well, scripture doesn't address everything, so the church and its tradition comes in. Others will say, scripture doesn't address this, so human reason has to come in. And what's happened in many um, Pentecostal and charismatic circles is that Scripture doesn't address the issues that I perceive to be important. So therefore, God has to still speak on these issues. And the way he'll do it is he'll speak directly to me right here and now, totally forgetting that firstly, what God perceives to be important and what we perceive to be important are often two very different things. And the fact that they are two very different things means we need God to determine what is important. And he has determined it. That's what you have in the pages of your Bible. Well said. Well, yeah, yeah. well said. And uh, now let me let me just get off, not, not to get off the topic of the sufficiency of Scripture. There's a lot to talk about. Uh, MacArthur talked also about proper worship. Okay, that's one of the things that I read uh, uh, from uh, the transcript from MacArthur's uh, first, I think it was the opening session there by John MacArthur. Um, let's talk about that a little bit. What, what did you? What was your take on that, or or, or how do you? How, how, how much of that was discussed? Um, you know, proper worship, the seriousness of worship, and how um, so many of the charismatics today are actually uh, claiming to uh, speak by the Holy Spirit, but yet at the same time they're blaspheming the Holy Spirit because of the way that they're uh, the, the way that they're going about things in their worship. I think it was a very interesting note that needed to be sounded. And there's always a danger when you start talking about um, the whole worship issue. There's always a danger that you become very legalistic and start saying you can't do this and you can't do this beyond what is written in Scripture. Right. I think that was touched on incredibly well in this conference. I did have some questions of my own, and maybe we'll get into that later. But on the whole, I think they sounded just the right note on the issue of worship. This is bigger, I think, than whether you have traditional or contemporary worship. That's just my opinion. There are others who would, particularly in the church I was in previously, who would disagree with me on that. Mm -hmm. But I honestly think that the issue is not whether you have a more contemporary sound or a more traditional sound. There are some traditional sounds that are completely irreverent by the manner of the content of what they say. And there is some contemporary stuff, which is absolutely fantastic and reverent and Christ um, glorifying. So I think it's bigger than that. I think it's 
the purpose for which music is being used in these circles. So you look at, um, there's a, it's interesting, I'm not sure if you got to see the Q&A session. Um, no. The first Q&A session, and they played clips from Jesus Culture. I think there's a worse clip out there than that. And um, funny enough, it was on Richard TV that I saw it. With Misty Edwards, who is, if you don't know who Misty Edwards is, she's the primary worship leader at IHOP. Yes. Um, like big yeah. Over in yeah. The city. Yes. And Misty Edwards has this clip where the first time I saw it, I laughed, and then I watched it again, and then I realized, wait a minute, something's wrong here. The song, she's basically singing a song, and the song is, listen to the rhythm, the rhythm, the rhythm. Listen, and it literally has this monotonous tone to it. It just keeps repeating that over and over and over again. That kind of music whereby it's just sort of mindless repetition. You're not meant to really engage the mind at this point. You know, it's trying to induce an experience rather than our singing truth. And the purpose of our worship is speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. You know, letting the word of Christ dwell in us richly. I think when you lose sight of that in what you call worship, you're off to the races, so to speak. Yeah. At that point, all sorts of stuff starts happening. That's why you can have Jesus culture being as popular as they are. Because their music is intentionally written in such a way as it's trying to uh, induce an experience rather than engaging the mind. That's, that's, a, that's a really good point. Much was made of the fact that, listen, when we gather to worship, our worship is in spirit mm-hmm. and in truth. Exactly. Both of those. Yes, we worship in spirit. We worship with, you know, our emotions and with our, you know, our heart. Absolutely. But we also worship in truth. Right. You need the objective standard of God's word to be the fuel for your worships. George MacArthur made a quote that he said, I've heard him say it so many times over the years, listening to him, but he said it again during the conference. The deeper you go in theology, the higher you go in worship. It, everything goes back to your view of God. And I got into a conversation with someone on Twitter about this who disagreed, and their basic premise was, so... Worship is all about me and it's not about God. I'm like, not at all. The issue is, you cannot worship what you do not know. Exactly. Exactly. And if you don't know God in his word, then how are you going to worship him? What are you worshipping? Right. At its worst, you're worshipping an idol. You're worshipping a God that's made in your image and not a God as he is. You cannot separate doctrine from worship. And that, that is a that is very good. The more you know about God, the more you want to worship God. I remember, Kofi, when I uh when I, I got saved in ninety five and I grew up in a Christian home and I had never uh read the Bible through. But that first year that I I, I, I came to know the Lord I read the Bible through, I think, two and a half times, and I was literally blown away. And I can't tell you how many times reading the Word of God, just reading it, just sitting down and reading the Bible, drove me to my knees in awe. I, how in the world somebody can think that sitting uh, in, in, a, in a music concert, like, say, a Jesus Culture concert, and, and, and just, just repeating a song 15 or 20 times, or however they do it, and, and, you know, lifting up your hands without hearing the word of God, without hearing truth, I just don't, I just don't see how in the world your heart can truly be engaged in genuine worship. It, it just can't be. Unfortunately, I think, too, the issue is that we are replacing, well, two, two main points, really. We're replacing our theology and our doctrine with how we feel and how excited or how worked up we can get. But also, too, it seems like the culture is in on this, we don't need theology, we just need Jesus. Mm-hmm. And uh, Kofi pointed out a good, you know, a good point when he was talking that the higher your theology is, the more you know God, and the more you know God, the greater your worship will become. And yeah. I think our culture has just really completely flipped it upside down and turned it completely on its head where it's not supposed to be. Right. 
So let me ask you this, Kofi. Did were were there were there names mentioned? Um, were there names mentioned there at the Strange Fire Conference? Uh, were there pastors, uh, you know, teachers that uh, are prominent in the charismatic movement? Names were mentioned, but not often. Okay. Which, um, I think was a good thing. I think sometimes um, what happens is that people hear these names and then immediately there's a sort of visceral reaction, particularly from those who disagree. They say, oh, but you're, um, but you're citing this person. If they're on the fringe, don't, don't mention names. Mm-hmm. You know, um, and all kinds of ridiculous excuses. So I think names were mentioned. Um, more often than not, it was basically people were quoted just for the ridiculousness of what they had said, but names weren't mentioned as much. Um, interesting, I sat in yesterday, for yesterday's breakout session, and I went to hear Professor Nathan Busenitz, who teaches historical theology at the seminary, and he did uh, a lesson on charismatic counterfeits, our modern gifts, like um, the ones we see in scripture. And at that point, he did mention names. He mentioned you know, the Wayne Grudems and the John Pipers and the Jack Dares and these names, because at that point you do need to mention names because they have gone to talk saying, yeah, this is what we believe regarding the spiritual gifts. So yes, names were used, but there wasn't a big focus on naming names as much, particularly because everyone who was there was going to get a copy of the book as well. So um, they didn't really focus on mentioning names up front in the hope that you go read the book and you can, Go and follow all the footnotes and all the quotes for yourself. Okay. Now that 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 reminds me. I just wanted to ask a question because you brought it up, and I was going to actually ask it earlier. I heard you mention Wayne Grudem and uh, John Piper, which these are well-known reformed people, and guys like C.J. Mahaney also. Now, was there any kind of a backlash from the reformed camp because MacArthur was holding this uh, conference, or were they pretty silent about? Well, none of the big names, none of the big names said any, I've said anything yet. Um, so then it, I've, again, I've been in sort of a bubble the last few days of the conference. So um, haven't heard anything from Piper, nothing from Grudem. Some of the smaller names in the Reformed Charismatic world have been very vocal. So um, a blocker called Adrian Warnock, um, from my part of the world, no less. Hmm. Um, has been very vocal in his criticisms of the conference, and he was tweeting throughout it. Um, some others as well, but nothing from the big names in the sort of reformed charismatic world. As to whether they will respond, waits to be seen. Um, they might, they might choose not to. Um, interesting, I was with a friend of mine for the last session last night, and he made the point that one person who definitely needs to say something at least is D.A. Carson, because as most people know, D.A. Carson is sort of the champion of the open but cautious position when it comes to the issue of the spiritual gifts. And his book, um, Showing the Spirit, uh, an interpretation of 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, has been cited with much approval in charismatic circles as a great treatment of this section and a really a defense of a more open approach to spiritual gifts from 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. As to whether he'll respond, time will tell. But there hasn't been that much of a backlash from within the Reformed Charismatic world as much as it's been Charismatics in general who have right. felt the need to respond. So the Reformed guys, that the smaller ones that may have uh, tweeted or said something, did any of them ever use scripture to back up the reason why strange fire should have been held? Or was it more of a kind of a, well, we need to keep a unity type or we just need to not cause well, divisiveness or anything like that? I can only think of one. I, and I've not read many of the responses. I've booked a load, a load of them to read at some point. One of them from my um, part of the world again, um, Andrew Wilson, who's part of a reformed charismatic network in the UK called New Frontiers. Um, he wrote one of the better responses, I think, to part of the conference anyway. Um, Dr. Tom Pennington did a lecture on a case for cessationism. And what Andrew Wilson did was to write in response to that from a charismatic perspective. That was one of the better responses, I think. Um, 
I know of Andrew Wilson's material from the past on other issues. You know, he's a he tries his hardest to be biblical and to work with the text of scripture. And so I think he did one of the better jobs in responding. Um, but yeah, on the whole, most of the responses have been, um, this is divisive, you know, um, this is just an attack on the work of the Holy Spirit. Cessationism um, has no room for the Spirit, and it's all just Bible, Bible, Bible. And that's been the general tone of the responses I've read and some of the people I've engaged on Twitter over the course of the week. Okay. Well, it's, it's kind of kind of odd that they would say stuff like it's just Bible, 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 because again, and yeah, I can't help but keep going back. Okay, what is our source of authority? Where are we placing? Are we placing our experiences in line with the authority of Scripture, or is the authority of Scripture kind of guiding that? It, it, I don't know. It seems like a lot of the charismatic response has been to go with their experience rather than the authority of Scripture. And that's the thing, um, a lot of the responses on Twitter were just that. You've never experienced these things, so who are you to question it? Right. Which is totally the wrong response. Uh, um, I've never I've never had a drink of alcohol, I've never taken drugs in my life, but I know both those things can be damaging to you. I don't have to have experienced them to know that. To right. sit there and say that you have to have experienced the gifts to make any sort of comment on them, doesn't make any sense. We don't expect that in our treatment of other religions. You don't sit there and say, well, you have to be a Muslim in order to point out the errors of Islam. No. You can simply pick up a Quran and read it. You can pick up what Muslims have said, and you can point out the errors from there. And if any movement is an error, I don't buy into this idea that you have to, quote-unquote, experience it to be able to critique it. It's, it's ultimately a form of Gnosticism. You know, we have this incipient knowledge within ourselves and other people don't get it because they've not experienced what we've experienced that's mm. not christianity in any way shape or form no not at all um let's um let's talk about some of the uh q a stuff here kofi um how many of the q a uh panels uh or q the q a discussions did you get to go to and uh it, which what was your favorite if you got to go to any of them um i went i was I was there for all the sessions. I went to both of the Q&A sessions that happened. Oh, there were two. Okay. Yeah, yeah, there was one on the Thursday and then one on the Friday. All right. Um, and both of them were interesting. I think the one on Wednesday was more eye-opening for many people in the crowd. A lot of the clips, because I spend a lot of time on, I spend more time on YouTube than I probably should. Um, a lot of the clips um, I've already seen. So it was just a case of watching them again and obviously hearing their comment on them. But the, particularly the one that happened on Wednesday was interesting because, you know, it just became apparent for many. And you could hear the conversations after the session that this has really become a free for all. And people are just doing whatever they feel like in the name of, quote unquote, experiencing the Holy Spirit. Mm. And. I think the panel did a very good job on Wednesday of saying, okay, look, again, everything goes back to your view of Scripture. Is Scripture enough, or do you need more? If you say you need more, where do you draw the line? Right. And that's why you can have the sort of things happening at Bethel Church, for instance, with, you know, quote-unquote fire tunnels and... Um, some Dropping the feathers, you know, the feathers that happen from there. Yeah, the feathers that fall into people's dinner plates at uh, exactly at stuff dinner. like that. You know. Okay, yeah. that's that's new to me. I'm sorry, I, I've never heard. Yeah, of they, 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 <laughs> feathers flying, no, falling. I, I heard. Uh, I, I I think it. Uh, there was a story about uh, Bill on the airplane and and uh, feathers falling uh, from the coming out of nowhere and the stewardess being so amazed that they were able to preach the gospel and she got saved. And weird stuff like that. You're right, it's a free-for-all. Did you get to meet anyone who was a charismatic and who might have had a change of mind uh, by attending the Strange Fire Conference? Yes, um, there was one young man who was in the line with us the first morning. Um, I basically, I'm staying in Van Nuys, which is not too far from the church, and so... Um, Another pair of guys who were in the same apartment block with me gave me lifts to the church for the conference. And um, in the first morning, we were in line with a Latin American fellow. I um, can't remember his name now. 
Um, Umberto, that's his name. And he was from a Pentecostal church. And obviously the conference hasn't started yet, and so we were talking to him, and he was sharing us, I'm from a Pentecostal church, and, you know, I'm kind of intrigued to hear what's going to be happening here, you know. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. And so as I caught up with him during the conference, it was interesting to hear him speak, and he said, yeah, I agree, I think... There are real issues here, and, you know, he wasn't going to change his mind there and then, but he was definitely now open to thinking about the issues. Yeah. There was now a sense of, okay, maybe I should be a little more critical, and obviously he got a free copy of the book, and, you know, he said, yeah, he's definitely going to go home and read it and think through it. And so I'd like to think that happened a lot more regularly. Again, I most of the people I met were already convinced um, of their position on this, but, yeah, I'm hoping that people listened in and people had something to think about and it wasn't just a case of a gut reaction rather than thinking and you know letting a man say his piece so to speak and mm. then making a response very good um did, uh, you, did you get to meet mark driscoll um <laughs> Okay. Well, this could get controversial, but you stole my thunder, Danny. Well, wait a minute. I I missed. I, I was I was laughing so loud. I didn't hear your your uh, comment, Kofi. What uh, What did you say about being controversial? controversial? But um, I'll tell you the story of what happened with my involvement. And there's an article floating around on the internet with a tweet of mine um, to another <laughs> friend about that. Hey, hey! Before you before you tell us the story, morning. before you tell us the story, um, mm -hmm. I, I'm sorry to interrupt. Don't worry about being. We're, Steve and I, we're, we're controversial. All that don't, I'm sure you know that. Don't worry about that. Just go ahead and tell us the story. <laughs> yeah, no, we are. We got a comment on uh, one of our podcasts that we were Satan's minions for uh, bringing up Joseph Prince. So yeah, we're controversial. So go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, so it was Friday morning. When the rumors came around that Mark Driscoll would turn up, I initially, I hadn't seen him tweet about it. I just thought, internet rumors, that's how things are. So when he tweeted saying that he was going to be there, giving out copies of his book, I just thought, huh? Now, I wanted to see it. Uh, my inner journalist, I study journalism, so my inner journalist sometimes kicks in. And so on that level, I wanted to see him. Now, in God's providence, um, I was invited by... Ray Merringer, who is Director of Admissions at Master Seminary, for a prospective student's lunch. Mm. So that was happening at the same time he was on campus. Mm. I say it's in God's providence because having heard what he did, I was not impressed. Um, I'm a big believer that as believers, we are above publicity stunts. And as far as publicity stunts go, that was a big one. Yeah. Um, to go to a conference that you have not registered for, that you have not received permission to distribute your material and just go and turn up and then to lie about what happened um, to me is reprehensible. Yeah. And I don't get that. He says, well, apparently the word on the street now is that he was, oh, I was just joking. They didn't confiscate my stuff. No, 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 no. You gave people the impression that um, they were unkind to you, that they took your material away from you. This is what the word confiscate means. Look, yeah. don't put that kind of an impression out there and just say you are joking. People are already emotionally charged on this conference. Yes. The last thing that we need is people stoking the fires like that. I was grossly unimpressed. And if I had seen him in person, I would have told him that. I would say, I don't want your book, thank you very much. I know I'm not going to read it. I'll, I'll be honest, I know I'm not going to read it. My to-read pile at home is already long enough. So I'm not going to read it yet. <laughs> and... For you to do what you're doing right now is actually incredibly immature. That was my thinking yeah, as well. I thought so. That's exactly what I what I was thinking as well. And and by the way, that was a little um, that was a little controversial there, uh, Kofi. You were getting a little uh, fired up. Don't I mean, don't don't get him scared, Danny. We're trying to keep him on the show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't don't I mean, scare him. I'd, and I say that not to be unloving or because I have any personal gripe against the man. I don't. But at the same time, doing stuff like that, and I have loads of issues with Driscoll, and his, I'm, I'm very sure we'll get to his article that he wrote um, yes. recently, but his characterization of cessationism already makes me not a big fan. 
Right. I think you could do much, but I think there are better people out there who disagree with cessationism and don't do what he does. Did you read his article? I did read his article. Um, it's more of the same that he's always said, um, the sort of mischaracterizations of various people. It's ironic that a man who sits there and accuses evangelicalism of being tribalistic is that, himself one of the worst people at doing that. Well, that, that, that was exactly what Danny pointed out when we were talking about this earlier. Both of us, it's like he's trying to bring division in order to bring unity. Of course, of course, that's that's why he supposedly wrote his article was to to bring unity. We need because he ends it with, "Well, we need more unity," and uh, but it's not. It's it. If anything, it is more divisive than the Strange Fire Conference. I mean, I don't know. I'm like, I'm like you, Kofi. I get upset and I get really, really angry when I read ignorant stuff like that. Well, that's what I was I, gonna. I was gonna ask you uh, what you thought of his talk about tribes and 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 I'm reading through this article. Now, I had heard uh, a, a show that Chris Roseboro did. Um, uh, this has been several months ago, and I, I can't even remember uh, the actual title of the show. But he was. He was discussing Mark Driscoll, and he was discussing discussing his, uh, you know, the whole tribal speech. And he, you know, uh, he talked about what. What do you think about that whole idea of uh, calling different camps tribes? Did you? Did you? In and of itself, I don't think it's the worst thing I've heard. I oh. do think there is an element to it sometimes. Um, particularly, I did this, and Stephen said that he's been following me more since I was seventeen. I shudder at seventeen-year-old me. <laughs> I really do, <laughs> because at seventeen, newly introduced to the doctrines of grace, and quite frankly, incredibly angry at some of the stuff I'd heard growing up, um, I burnt a lot of bridges that I had no business burning. Now, some of them I did because they were just not going to be beneficial to my spiritual life in any way. But other times, it was just a case of, I'm a young man. I have this platform, and I will use it to take shots at friendly. To that extent, I understand what he's saying. His solution, however, is where I think we differ. I'll give you an example. I am not a Presbyterian. I don't believe in baptizing babies. Apologies to my Presbyterian friends. Love you to death. No, uh, no, no, no offense. Go ahead. <laughs> um, Danny is a Presbyterian. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Sorry, sir. But, hey, no, no. Hey, listen. It's okay. We're just, we're just teasing. You. We're just messing we're with just you. <laughs> but um, are there elements to which me and a Presbyterian can work together? Absolutely. But there are also other elements to which we will never agree because presuppositionally, we have very different views on things. The answer is not to say, um, let us as it were, downplay our differences. No, it's, listen, here are our differences. Let's be open about our differences. And where we agree, let's join hands. With that, I have no problem. But to sit there and say, the solution is in, you know, read my book. I have the solution mm -hmm. to the problem of quote-unquote tribalism in evangelicalism doesn't help. Some of the divisions in evangelicalism are good, and I would not change them for the world. I'm sorry, but I am never going to join hands with a Stephen Furtick type, even if you paid me. Tough. <laughs> I'm sorry, a man who sits there and blasts his church members for wanting to go deeper when his teaching is a sh as deep as a puddle? Really? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. I'm supposed to join hands with that? No, not going to happen. Well, I mean, nor, nor should you join, and I'm saying this as, as politely as I possibly can. But mm -hmm. I mean, you have to go back, and and I know this is all that you know. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm I'm digging up bones here, but you have to go back with Driscoll too, and you have to, and him and McDonald both, and the whole elephant room fiasco, mm -hmm. um, and and just uh, up there embracing a yeah, a yeah, heretic. I mean, there's nothing yeah. you can, I, in in my opinion. You know, you got you got this kind of stuff happening out there. So, you, so when you talk about unity, when he talks about unity, I get scared. Okay, Here's because you can't you can't unify you can't you can't have unity with um with 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 
with a with a heretic. You can't you can't have unity with heretics. Let's put it that way. Here's the thing. I kind of foresaw his the fact that this shift was going to happen. He pop, he published an article um, a few months back, and a lot of people didn't talk about it. But I bookmarked it and I said, "Time will tell with this one." He said, and this is a summary. Listen, I have a church of so many thousand people. In my reform circles, I can't learn how to be a quote-unquote mega church pastor from my reform friends because none of their churches are big enough. I have to look outside the, outside of my circle. And as I sit there and I think, I read that and I thought, well, let's see who else is in that circle of mega church people. You've got mm-hmm. Joel Osteen. Mm-hmm. Joel Osteen doesn't say anything to learn from because there's no content there. Exactly. So, okay, there's him. There's, you know, the Stephen Furtick, Perry Noble types. Mm-hmm. Um, no. The, again, nothing to teach of any significant value. Andy Stanley's? No. The Andy Stanley type. Yeah, let's not even go there. Um, <laughs> don't give then you've got the like Pentecostal that. style mega churches, like the Word of Faith type mega churches. Okay. So, what are you going to learn from them? How to please the flock? Right. <laughs> and in the. Go- Go ahead, Steve. On, the, on that note, let me. I'm going to play devil's advocate for a minute here, and uh, I'm going to I'm going to bring up this point because I think there is there is some, not much, but there is some validity behind what charismatics say, and not just charismatics, but other other people in evangelical Christianity that oftentimes, and reform folks are guilty. I've been guilty of this that we just completely shun or somehow sometimes are harsh in our uh, judgments or our conclusions about them individually or about the way they worship. Uh, I agree. Yeah, and, and I think we, there, there does need to be a lot of room for charity and love and grace. But like you said, like you said, the differences need to be open. We don't need to have, and again, I'm not trying to, uh, you know, bring up the elephant thing, but the elephant in the room is the actual, you know, whatever you call it, the innuendo or whatever you want to call it. But uh, Mm -hmm. there does need to be talk about that. There does need to be openness about the differences. And like you say, you join hands where you can join hands, but at some point there does have to be the line drawn and saying, no, Mm -hmm. I can't cross that line with you. Yeah. I mean, um, for example, back home, some of my closest friends are members of the Calvary Chapel movement. We have significant theological differences. In some cases, incredibly significant. But we can sit together at a table and have dinner and pray for one another. Why? Because when it comes down to the heart of the gospel, we agree enough that there's no need for me to be rude and arrogant and condescending. And I catch flack from some of my reform friends for the fact that I won't throw my Calvary Chapel friends under the bus. Yeah. I don't yeah. need to do that. See, that kind of yeah. attitude really bothers yeah. me. Well, I, um, someone, a friend of mine in Wales, um, pointed out that, you know, if we're going to accuse the charismatics of not being self-critical, we need to, in our reform circles, we need to think about that as well. And I agree. I think in our Calvinistic circles, Sometimes we aren't as self-critical as we could be. Yeah, you know, we tend to think agree. we have it all together and everyone else needs to look to us without realizing, actually, we have our problems too. Yep. Yep. That's, uh, and I, you know, it took me a long time to learn that because when I first came to reform theology, I was, I was excited. I was excited about the things I was learning and I was excited to share what I was learning. And oftentimes I think that comes across as being arrogant. And truthfully, a lot of times in my comments, I was arrogant because now all of a sudden, hey, I'm reformed and you're not. So I have the upper hand on you theologically. And, and I think that's been a big problem within some reform camps, not all, but some. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I think I think part of the solution to that is, um, to quote, funny enough, a reform charismatic. <laughs> um Joshua Harris, he talks about the idea of humble orthodoxy, that, yes, I am awful orthodoxy, very much so. But at the same time, holding that orthodoxy in such a way as to be humble and to be able to say, listen, I come to God's word, I study it, this is where I land, and I am firm on this. 
but I am also humble enough to listen to my brother and to open the possibility that maybe I might be wrong. I mean, if he can open scripture to me and put, I love Dr. MacArthur said this. He said, I think it was yesterday's Q and A. He said, if someone opens a Bible and shows me where I'm wrong, I'll accept it. Yeah. You know, that kind of a humility is sometimes in our reform circles, we get this belief that, well, what we believe is biblical. Therefore, I could never be wrong. Everyone else needs to prove to me that they're right. Well, that's arrogance. Yeah. yeah. If you're not able to be taught and able to be corrected, you have no you have no business seeking to try and teach and correct others. Exactly. I was going to say, Danny, you were awful quiet. No, no, I'm, I'm actually no, no, you, no, <laughs> not at all. But one of the things I think the biggest thing that bothers me is the people that the, are the people that are being duped by all of this stuff. You know, that they, they're mm-hmm. the people who are the sheep. There, there, are, there are sheep, there are people who are godly people in these churches, and you have, like you mentioned, men like Stephen Furtick, who are up there and who are blasting their people for wanting to hear more. You have people in these churches who really are saved, they really want to know Christ, and their leaders and their teachers are not pointing them to Christ. They're not showing them Christ from the scriptures. They're not teaching them doctrine. And one of the things that I find so incredible is, and even in, even in uh, my own church, sadly to say, is how little people know the scriptures. I wrote an article when I was 19, I think I was 19, um, called Don't Waste Your Brain. Um, I'm actually at the moment working on a rewrite of it just because I think there's some things I said there I wouldn't say today and some things that um, I would say today that I didn't say then. And so working on a rewrite of that. But my basic point was um, preachers and teachers have forgotten what their function is. Mm-hmm. The Bible says in Ephesians 4 that God has given to his church pastors and teachers for the work of equipping the saints. If we've been given pastors and teachers for the job of equipping the saints, how are they supposed to do that? Second Timothy 3.16 tells us that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. We equip God's people to do the work they've been called to do through the scriptures. Amen. You mentioned Stephen Fertig. Yeah. Um, and part of the reason that I have such a near visceral reaction anytime I watch videos of his so-called preaching is simply this. You have influence to reach millions. I mean, through his website, through the videos, and it's all very nicely done from a media perspective. You know, he does his job well. Oh, yeah, I've, I've been on his site. He's got to get to get, you're right. You're absolutely right. And with all that influence, you use it to peddle sugar water, basically. Yeah. Instead of giving the people milk and meat, you give them sugar water. Right. That bothers me. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Because I think, for example, I've been here at Grace Church and for the last week, and you can see the mock difference. By most standards, Grace Church is a mega church of sorts. I think they say something around the reason of 3,000 people here every Sunday, something like that. Mm-hmm. And it's a big church. But it's interesting. I was When I went on Sunday to Sunday service, they have two worship services. And what happens is everyone goes for one of the worship services. And then they have smaller groups where they're still getting taught. So essentially, you're hearing two sermons. <laughs> And I went to one of the fellowship groups. Um, they were going through Ephesians 6 and the whole um, the whole subject of the armor of God. And it was good Bible teaching. They had a slightly more interactive format than a typical sermon. Mm-hmm. But there was still good teaching, still digging into God's word. And people were being equipped. I mean, I saw you know, people... People had their uh, iPads out taking notes, people writing stuff down, people were asking questions, and they were being engaged with God's truth. Mm. I think it is unloving of any minister who has the opportunity to sit there and say, well, I keep it simple just because I want to be more evangelistic. 
we should all be more evangelistic. But I don't believe that the primary function of a local church church worship service is evangelism. Amen. I get shot at all the time for saying that, but you can't show me that in the Bible. Amen. No, that's, that's, what that's, I that's, see is, is for the edification of believers. Yes, and then exactly. believers go out, so we gather to evangelize, and then we we gather to worship, excuse me, and gather to be taught, and then we scatter to evangelize. Amen. That's the model I see in the Bible. Amen. Yeah, and, and, and if, you go, Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Dash. I'm sorry. So, and so if... Pastors are not doing that job. No wonder their people are open yeah. to all this stuff. I mean, again, Stephen Furtick. If you remember, he did his um, Cold Orange revival. Was it the beginning of this year? Um, yeah, but it, this time I think he had it as a closed. Uh... Oh, it was last year that he had it open then. Um, no, it's actually I. Now I could be wrong, but I think he's closed it now two years in a row. I think it was the year before oh, wow. it was open. I think. I, don't quote me. Don't quote me on it, but I, I think. I could be wrong. Okay. Okay. But, um, basically, the year when they had that, mm -hmm. and I was able to watch that, one thing that really tripped me out about it was the fact that he had such a wide mix of people coming to speak to his church every night. I mean, you went from having Craig Groeschel, who is just a mega church type, and there's no idea theologically where he's at, to... Jensen Franklin, who is a Pentecostal, and then um, Matt Chandler, mm -hmm. who is more on the Calvinistic side of things. Yeah. And then T.D. Jakes, the wonders guy. Wow. Um, then um, Stovall Weems, who is more um, word of faith. And then you just had this mix of people, and it's just like, you no. Know, for example, when he introduced Dan, uh, when he introduced, uh, what's his name now? TDJ is like, oh, TDJ is one of my favorite preachers. But well, T, you say you're not a charismatic, but you're inviting a Pentecostal bishop who is steeped in word faith theology, mm -hmm. who is at best unclear and at worst a outright denier of the Trinity. Mm -hmm. And. You expect me, to, and you said they say he's one of my favorite preachers. If you like that discernment and you're the shepherd, Lord help you. Yeah. Because yeah. they don't stand a chance. Absolutely. Well, uh, Coffee, any other thing you want to tell us about Strange Fire? What What was the main thing? What let, Let's just put it this way. What was the What was the main thing that you yourself personally are that you're going to take away from this this uh, this conference? I'm not trying to put you on the spot. <laughs> no worries. Um, I think, I'll put it this way. If there was one thing I actually I came to this conference hoping for and will go home and take with me, it's a need to properly understand the work of the Holy Spirit. Mm. Um, in a lot of ways, a conference like this wouldn't be necessary if regularly um, I teach in my local church um, Stephen, I know you preach in your local church as well. Yes. Um, if we who have to open God's word took time to regularly deal with the person and work of the Holy Spirit, people would know what the true work was, and so they wouldn't be suckered in by accountability. Yeah. And so that's one thing I'm taking home with me, the fact that I need to, in my preaching and in my teaching, emphasize the true work of the Holy Spirit. You know, not that in the sense of that's all I'm going to talk about, but as I go through Scripture, I need to, where, you know, Scripture necessitates me talking about it, mm -hmm. I need to take the time and expound the true work of the Spirit so that when um, someone comes to, and I see it in the class I teach already, um, I teach a Foundations of Faith class at my church, and wow. there's a young lady who comes to our class, um, and she came to me and said, my friend invited me to this church, and she named the name of the church, and asked, have you heard of it? And just so happened I had. And she was like, yeah, I heard some of the stuff that my friend was telling me, and it sounded suspect. Now, I don't go out, and I remember some of the stuff you've taught in class. Now, I've not gone out of my way to go naming and shaming all these various groups in London. One, that's a full-time job. I don't have time to do that. Mm -hmm. And I would rather spend my time in a class 
teaching what scripture actually says and equipping you to do the work of discernment yourself. But she was like, I heard, I, I heard her talking and it didn't match up with what you've shown us in studying scripture. I was comforted in that because I had pointed out the true work of the Holy Spirit and, pe- and God's sheep hear his voice through Amen. his word. They know yes. when they're being misled. And so I think that's the one thing I'm taking home with me. The need to rest again in the sufficiency of scripture. Teach the scriptures. Teach what the scriptures really say about the Holy Spirit. And arm God's people in such a way that they won't be led astray by these various false teachers. Amen. That that's great. That's, you know, Kofi, I, I also teach a found the foundations class in, in, in our church as well. And um, we have a rather small class, but it it, it it really can get interesting. Let me ask you, are you, this is just a, you know, a, a personal question as far as your teaching style goes. Now, do you, do you, is it, is it a more interactive class or is it, um, is it, uh, you know, you, you teaching through uh, certain aspects of theology? Um, well, the way the course works is we have this material that's, again, produced by Grace Church and... Um, it's 13 lessons, walks through, you know, some of the basic tenets of the faith. And I try to keep it as interactive as possible because it is one thing for me to convey information, but I think one of the best ways that people learn, and I'm not saying this in slight of preaching, I think there's a difference between what my pastors do week in, week out, and what I do in my classes. So this is not an attack on preaching. Mm -hmm. But I think sometimes people have questions and their questions are a reflection of where the blind spots are in their own knowledge. Yeah. And so I try to keep it as interactive as possible, you know, let people ask their questions. And if that means I can't get through all my material today, that's fine. I would much rather we got to the issues which are concerning you. You know, we got to, let's say if someone introduced this false doctrine to you, I would rather be dealt with that and make Amen. sure you were straight rather than I need to get through my outline. Amen. I don't like to wait another week. We'll be okay. Amen. But, That's good, man. You know, at the end of the day, you know, these are God's people. I love them, and I want to feed them with God's word and feed them appropriately for where they're at. That's that's awesome. That is awesome. And and I can I can totally relate to where you're at. I've had the same thing happen. And as a matter of fact, last week we didn't even one of the ladies in the class asked a question, and we didn't even get to the material at all. I actually erased the board and said, "Okay, this is." <laughs> I, I, said, I, I, our Sunday school, our Sunday school uh, material is not even going to be dealt with today. So let's just talk, and that's what that's what I like about about uh, you know teaching foundations. People, when you start teaching theology, you start teaching doctrine. People are naturally going to have questions, and it gives us an opportunity to really be able to uh, uh, open up the scriptures and share what God has to say on any any, any given topic that they may want to ask about. Mm-hmm. And, and, and that's where we're held accountable at as teachers. It's it's not like uh, like Kofi said. It's not how much knowledge you can have, uh, you know disseminate. It's how well. It's just it's it's how well you're getting through to the people that God has placed under your care. And uh, it is. It's I, th- I think it's very important. And I think uh, that's discipleship. Yeah. That's part of what discipleship is. You know, the Great Commission is to preach the gospels, but it's to make disciples. Yes. And uh, Kofi brought up Ephesians 4 earlier and made a very good point that the pastor's job is to equip the saints. And then right after that, in that scripture, it says, for the work of the ministry. Yes. We are to equip God's people to go out. And Kofi, again, you brought this up very well. They are the ones to go out and take what they have learned and then to begin evangelizing. The church is primarily made for God's people to gather together to worship God and to be equipped to do the work of the ministry. Yeah, um, I was talking to a friend of mine from university, and he was, you know, was um, just sharing them what I'm up to nowadays and explaining I'm teaching at church. And he goes, hmm, that's interesting. Um, if we could use this, and this is how journalists talk, we like to use analogies and questions. He was like, if you could use one analogy for what you do, what would it be? And I said, I consider myself a coach. Wow. The coach's job is to give you, give the players the skills and information to go play the game. I'm now the best coaches, in my opinion, of also are those who have played and are playing. And so 
yes, I evangelize. I talk to people as well. But my job when I step up to my class on a Sunday afternoon or Wednesday night is to equip them in, in such a way that they can go out and play the game. Mm-hmm. That they can go out and do what needs to be done and to do it effectively. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of how I see myself. I always joke that um, I'm a coach and welcome to my training session. And people always <laughs> laugh. But, you know, um, in a way, that's what we do as those who preach and who teach. You know, those who preach and teach. We're coaches. And to, for us to be able to do our job effectively, we need to know. So that it's a terrible coach who doesn't watch games and doesn't know what's happening out there, who doesn't know um, doesn't know the latest drills, and so you can't effectively lead your team. Right. And that's how I see myself as someone who opens God's word and teaches, first for my own edification, and then to edify others so that they're able to go out and do the work more effectively. Mm-hmm. Very good analogy, sir. Very good analogy. Well, Kofi, it has been, and it, we've been on now for 80 minutes. I think this is the longest wow. podcast that uh, we've had. Now, one thing I do want to say really quickly, Steve, do you realize we have been doing this now for over a year? Yeah, we hit our uh, year mark. I think it was October 1st or October 2nd. No, no, I was wow. down there. Congratulations, October. guys. What's that? Congratulations, guys. Oh, thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, it's it's actually, I think it was the 11th because I came down on the 10th. We started out as just a... You know, no, you just, came down. You came down September the thirtieth, and it was September thirtieth, October first, October second, and October third. There you go. All right. Well, this is uh, Kofi. This is this has been a privilege and an honor. I, I really, really appreciate you taking your time, calling us all the way from California, and uh, just just spending the evening with us here discussing these things. And I, you know, I think that um, I think that we would love to have you on the show again sometime. Would you be willing to do that? Absolutely. All right. All right. Been great, man. It really has. It really has. Well, listen, folks. Yeah, thank you. It's been great fun. Folks, thank you very much for listening. And Lord willing, we will see you next week. And uh, Kofi, again, why don't you tell them uh, what your, the name of your blog is, where they can go to find you? Sure. Um, my blog is Fiery Logic, and you can find that at fierylogic.com. F I E R Y logic.com and we will also post your link on our uh, on our speaker page is that is that okay with you absolutely all right praise uh, praise the lord thank you very much for joining us folks uh we will see you next time well there you have it that is the end of the interview uh thank you again kofi for joining us if you want to check us out you can find us at facebook.com forward slash long for truth see got it right that time and you can also check us out on our blog at uh, longfortruth.blogspot.com. See you next time.